Hello, I'm Lindsay Beal. I'm an occupational therapist based in New York City, and I'm the co-author of Raising a Sensory Smart Child and the author of Sensory Processing Challenges, Effective Clinical Work with Kids and Teens. Today, I'm going to share with you uh, what I call sensory smart strategies. And these are things that you can do to help your child, uh, your teenager, or your adult child, or yourself to feel and function better in this crazy sensory world that we're living in. So let's go ahead and start. Okay. So we first learn about the world through our senses and sensory processing is the neurological process um, that we undergo to take those little bits of sensory input and turn them into meaningful messages. This is something we usually do automatically, but because of differences in how different people are wired. Um, some people take in and use sensory information in a different way. And this can range from like the quirky little things that we all have to really severe dysfunction because uh, a person's body may be so uncomfortable uh, handling some uh, different sensory experiences. So there are some basic profiles. There's the hypersensitive person for whom everything is too loud. Everything's coming in too loud. They may be on high alert and really rigid and easily overloaded, overstimulated. A child may um, avoid certain kinds of input, but seek that input out when they're in control. So your child may um, complain about bright lights, but be the person when they're home, they're turning the bright lights on and off because they want to figure it out, but they need to be in control. Then some people are hypo or undersensitive to sensory input. And for these people, it's as if the input is coming in too quietly. Um, the person may be kind of under aroused or tuned out, a little bit hard to engage. Um, they may be sluggish, hard to wake up, hard to get them to really pay attention. Um, they may start off like a droopy little Eeyore uh, from Winnie the Pooh and then rev up because they want to engage and end up like Tigger kind of bouncing against the walls. Um, there are also people who are real sensory seekers. Um, they can be described by parents or teachers uh, as a little bit too much. They just always want more input. They're always speaking loud and making a lot of noise and moving around and, and uh, touching things and so on. So most people have kind of mixed reactivity because their nervous system is so unstable. And a lot of this depends on uh, academic and social demands, stress, how well they've slept, how well they've eaten, how many different changes they've had to make throughout the day, whether or not they have allergies, um, if they are going through hormonal changes, but a lot of it also depends on sensory load. Um, and is, is there too much on their paper plate? Is their paper plate gonna fall apart? So in real life, this ends up being, you know, kids who struggle with one or more channel or mode of sensory input. More often we see kids struggling with multi-sensory input. It's just too much to like hear and see and smell and all of that. And they end up going into, I, we see a lot of mono-channel processing and they'll turn off one source of input in order to tune into another. Like they may not look at you when they're trying to listen to you, or they may have trouble eating in a noisy cafeteria. Um, and a lot of times when kids are struggling to cope with all these different multi-sensory demands, they end up engaging in self-stimulatory behaviors and meltdowns because it's 
it's just too much. They, they need uh, to self-soothe through these behaviors. And if they can't self-soothe, they might just lose it and have a full meltdown. So what are we going to do about it? It, it really helps um, when you see a behavior that concerns you, it's, you know, your automatic response is going to be like, I, I want the behavior to stop. I need to stop that behavior. But we need to connect the dots between the behavior and the sensory underpinnings that are driving the behaviors. Right? We can't change the behavior unless we know what's causing the behavior. So, you know, I recommend that parents keep a journal of the different situations and different triggers and patterns that can be causing some behaviors that you don't want to be seeing in your child. Use, go ahead and use um, the sensory screening tools that you'll find on my websites. Um, and, and this will help you to predict when there's going to be a problem and to prevent uh, the problems from occurring in the first place. You want to get a sensory evaluation and intervention from a specialist in sensory processing problems. And that's usually an occupational therapist with advanced training in this specialty. And you want to, as a parent, um, collaborate with the occupational therapist and the physical therapist, if there's one on the team, and the developmental optometrist, if that's part of your child's team, and the audiologist, and the, a nutritionist, and a neurologist, and a feeding therapist, and a psychologist, whoever is on your child's team, you need to collaborate with them. And as a parent, you are the, the common theme. You need to get everyone working together with shared goals, uh, which you should be explaining your goals and, you know, everyone's, we're all on the same team with you. Uh, very important role that parents play. Um, and then finally, you're going to implement practical solutions for environments and different activities your child participates in at school, at home, and when you're out and about in the act in the community. So I'm gonna give you some practical solutions now that I think will help you and your family. So let's think about, you know, first the, the touch sense. It's not just what do you feel and where do you feel it? And is it a dangerous kind of a touch? But there is light touch, which is very arousing. You know, this is light touch and, and it, triggers kind of protective responses. That versus deep pressure touch, which is very calming and organizing. So in general, you want to give your child deep pressure. If you wanna help them calm down, just give them some deep pressure in their shoulders. That can often be enough to help a child to feel reassured. Um, Think about clothing and shoes and socks, this kind of thing, bedding, lotion, glue. Um, you, a lot of times kids are avoiding unexpected touch, touch coming from behind, being too close to others, touch that happens during cleanup time or circle time or from the vibration of an air conditioner or a truck. Um, also under the category of, of touch is temperature, the changing seasons going from indoors to outdoors, all of these are part of the tactile sense. So if you know your child fights with you to go outside, um, it can be a tactile problem because it's very hard to transition from um, the warmth of indoors out into the cold, or if it's summertime and it's nice and cool inside to go out into the heat, that can be a problem. So you need to think about that. What is the contribution uh, of temperature? Also pain. Um, uh, some people are oversensitive and or undersensitive to pain. And that's all a part of this tactile piece. So 
what do we do about it? Um, you want to strengthen your child's ability to tolerate different kinds of touch. You want to um, avoid light and unexpected touch. Come, you know, when you're approaching your child, come towards the front, let them see you before you touch them. The same thing for teachers. Um, you may wanna position a child against a wall when they're sitting at, at circle time. So they're not always worried that someone's gonna to touch them from behind. You also wanna speak with an OT about desensitizing your child's skin through massage and deep pressure, vibration, using a sensory bin like the one that I set up there with uncooked dry rice and beans and playing in that and getting the hands in there. You can also teach a child to rub their hands before touching something yicky like um, glue or, or something else that bothers them like Play-Doh and really get them in there and touching and rubbing as hard as they can. It's also a good way to teach them uh, how to wash their hands. So you're gonna accommodate and respect uh, their sensory differences by providing seamless socks or turning the socks inside out so the seams aren't right on the feet. Uh, going for soft tag-free clothing, just go ahead and cut the tags out. Consider a weighted or a compression garment. Um, Think about different textures of bedding and blankets and towels. When you're putting lotion on your child, use deep pressure. Don't just sort of rub it on really using that light touch because that might is a big part of why a lot of our kids uh, really hate to have lotion on their bodies. Just really get there. There's a good chance to give um, a nice massage when you're putting on uh, moisturizing lotion or sunblock or that kind of thing. Look into non-foaming toothpaste. Uh, consider providing a glue stick instead of squeeze glue. Um, offering a child a paintbrush. Uh, they don't, there's no law that says that they have to do finger painting, right? And adding a soft uh, Pencil grip to a pencil may help a child accept using a pencil more comfortably. Uh, try a vibrating toothbrush to uh, a lot of kids are much happier with toothbrushing if they have that vibration uh, in their hand and in their mouth. So uh, again, the preferential seating is gonna be important. Let's talk about auditory processing. A lot of our kids are like, it's too loud. Um, so there is that, uh, that loudness factor, but it can also be a high frequency sensitivity, like a high frequency, like a hairdryer or a blender or a low frequency sensitivity, like airplanes going past or deep booming voices or drums uh, with music. Some kids really, you uh, know, are reactive to that. Most of us start to hear at um, uh, zero to 15 decibels of sound. Some of our kids hear too well. They have a condition called hyperacusis. So they can hear at zero decibels of sound or even below that negative 15 decibels of sound. They're just super sensitive to sound and so much sound comes into their brains and their ears and it becomes very difficult to filter out the unimportant noises and really pay attention to what's important. So that's something to consider. Um, with the sound sensitivity, you're going to investigate any ear infections that could be causing decreased or distorted hearing. You wanna think about migraines, um, hyperacusis that we talked about early, the hypersensitivity to sound. You wanna think about um, protecting your child's hearing with earmuffs like the Peltor ones there in pink. And that's just for really the, the, really the worst times for your child. If there's a thunderstorm, if you're going to see fireworks, you want to protect those delicate ears. For an older child or for you or an adult child, um, earplugs like the Vibes, uh, hi-fi earplugs go into the ears and they reduce the volume. 
Um, there's uh, white noise machines and CDs and you wanna provide quiet space and maybe double pane windows to block out some of the traffic noise if it's interfering with your child's sleep. You want to talk to an OT about building skills through a therapeutic listening program that's specially designed music that helps to exercise the ears. Um, or speak with um, an OT or a speech language pathologist, or even an audiologist about an FM unit, which is where the like a teacher will speak into a microphone and it travels right directly to your child's ears. You also want to desensitize through daily life exposure. Um, you can record sounds that the child is like really frightened of. Um, or you can use something like the Sound Ease CDs, uh, which are available in Root to Greatness or on Amazon. They're all over the place. Um, so that has, you know, some of the typically scary sounds set to really rhythmic, lovely music to sort of break that association of, for example, a dog barking with danger. It's like, oh, the dog's barking, you know, and it, it just becomes. Um, uh, a less frightening kind of experience for the child. So um, you want to think about the visual system. Remember that vision is not just seeing well up close and far away. It's the ability of the eyes to move smoothly, um, the ability to keep the eyes converged for single clear vision being able to, to follow objects and people as they move around. Vision also has to do with being able to tell the difference between the foreground and the background. So that lets your child find you in a store or locate a toy on a crowded toy shelf. Um, vision also um, includes depth perception, which is needed to climb downstairs and to catch a ball because you need to be able to see it coming closer and closer to you. Um, so if your child has also poor fine and, uh, and gross motor skills, if your child's having difficulty learning to read, is very visually distractible, prefers large colorful objects away from their body or tends to focus only on things that are nearby, you really want to rule out vision issues. You can um, find a great developmental optometrist at this website, covd.org. Um, that stands for the College of Optometrists in Vision Development, covd.org. So also start to think about lighting in your home. Um, if you can uh, avoid overhead lighting, which reflects off surfaces and bounces right up into your child's eyes, that's a big problem at school sometimes. If you just add matte on not shiny paper onto a tabletop, onto a tabletop um, that's going to help with that light bouncing if you can't do anything about those overhead lights. If you can, Replace fluorescent lights. Sensitive people can see and hear fluorescent lights as they flicker. So you wanna to try to turn them off, um, replace them with a warm LED bulb, an incandescent old fashioned light bulb, or a halogen bulb. Ideally, the light should be at eye level. Um, and that often makes vision much more comfortable for learning to read or doing homework, that kind of thing. Uh, that, so that often works best as does like soft natural light. You don't want harsh sunlight coming in through your window because that's too harsh, but it's if it's diffused, uh, a little bit softened, that can be great. You can also use a diffuser like the Cozy Shades uh, that's there in the picture. And that attaches to any uh, overhead uh, fixture with magnets. And they're not super expensive uh, and you can find those online. If your child is using um, a lot of devices, an iPhone, an iPad, you know, a, a Mac computer, 
or you know windows or chromebook um looking at a screen all day with that white background and the black type on top of it it's it's really tiring for the eyes it's eye strain and it can really be overwhelming over time so most devices have a built-in accessibility setting um, that you can go to and you can change the color. Uh, the only one that I'm aware of that does not have it built in is the Android phone and tablet. And for that, you need to get an app, uh, the Erlen Colored Overlay app. But the rest of them uh, to date that I know of, all have this built into accessibility. So you go into your settings, general display, accessibility and add a color filter. And just to give you a little sense of what it feels like, consider this versus that, right? It's really, really different. And there are many, many different colors to choose from that can really help. Going back to our senses, um, the sense of smell, we often don't think about that as something that might be affecting your child and your child's behavior. But remember, smell travels directly to the emotional center of the brain called the limbic system. And the, this is a danger detection. It's a very primitive sensory system. Um, it detects toxic fumes and rotten food. Unfortunately, so it's a really protective, great sense, but unfortunately for some people, if they have a hypersensitive smell system, the beautiful meal that you've cooked is going to smell bad to them. It's gonna smell dangerous and you're not gonna eat something that smells dangerous for you. So you wanna think about um, lotions, the smell of lotions and deodorant and perfume. You want to avoid these things. Just go unscented. You're always safer with unscented. Um, adults forget about coffee breath and how intense, co you know, you have a cup of coffee and then you talk to a child and they're like, oh, that coffee is really, really strong. So you want to um, rinse out your mouth after having some coffee. Think about body odor that the student in school is like pushing away other kids, um, maybe reacting to their body odor. Um, it's just so strong for them and dangerous for them that you may have what looks like an aggressive child who's just trying to get away from the smell. And I'm not talking about dirty kids, but you know, just we all have an odor. Um, so having classmates being smelling nice and fresh is a good thing. Also think about cleaning products, again, going for the unscented uh, cleaning products. Um, and art supplies and you know bathrooms increasing your ventilation in the bathrooms. Uh, both taste and smell contribute to feeding issues along with touch, the, te the texture and the temperature and vision. So a food may look gross to the child because it looks a little bit weird, um, a little bit different. So the macaroni and cheese they love from one brand uh, may be the only acceptable macaroni and cheese. If it's from another brand, it may look different and therefore wrong and gross and disgusting and they may refuse to eat it. Even though you know mac and cheese is usually their one food that they will eat reliably. Um, a lot of kids with sensory issues crave certain flavors, usually sweet or salty, or they may seek out strong flavors like really spicy flavors. And um, another thing is with smell, what you can do is you can play smell games. So set up little jars and have different spices and have the child smell the spices. If this would be fun with them, put on a blindfold and see if they can recognize the smell of a lemon, for example, or cinnamon or you know, some other smells. That's a fun game to play with kids who would enjoy that kind of thing. Smelling flowers, different objects, everything has a smell. You can try something called preemptive masking. And with preemptive masking, if you know your child has 
a meltdown every time you go into the grocery store. You can give them a smell that they enjoy, put it like um, either on their wrists and have them rub their wrists and smell it, or a little bit on a cotton ball and have them smell that so that it's that smell in their nose instead of the, the smell that they find unacceptable. Um, some people uh, actually love the smell of Vicks Vapo Rub, and you can just dab that safely right on the skin under the nose. It's a very strong smell. Your child, you know, may not like it, but a lot of kids love it. And so, you know, they can be smelling that instead of nasty things. Um, avoid scented detergents and hair products, skip laundry softeners. Um, and avoid strong chemical cleansers. So do I do recommend that you find a, a high quality essential oil that your child loves. A lot of kids love sweet orange oil or rose or vanilla. Some kids love lavender. It's, it's different for everybody. Um, so you want to find a couple that your child really loves, and then they can, you know, you can put it on the cotton bag and have it in a zip, a cotton pad and have it in a Ziploc bag and carry it with you um, in case you're on the subway and there's, you know, a homeless person and with their strong smell, they can quick inhale roses and they're smelling roses instead of, you know, the other smells. Um, so, yeah. Now, a couple more sensory systems. There's the vestibular system, and that's in the inner ear, and that, that's our movement sense. And we can really feel that when we're in the playground or at the gym, when you're in a car or on an airplane, but also when like little head movements, like if bending to pick up something, tying shoelaces. There's also the proprioceptive system. And that refers to the body awareness we get from sensory receptors in the muscles, the joints, the ligaments, and other connective tissue. And that tells you where your body parts are without looking. And when you do that, when you have that going, working really well, you can move gracefully right? And you can grade your force. You're not using too much force. This will help you to pick up a fork and color nicely and do your handwriting and tie shoelaces, touching gently, um, touching other people gently. Um, any kind of fine motor skill, a lot of that it's dependent on the proprioceptive system. It also helps to keep our bodies organized and tells us where our center of gravity is, and that helps us to navigate space. So the vestibular and the proprioceptive system work together like a GPS um, so that the child knows where, their, where all their body parts are at any given time. And it's really, it forms the basis of your child's uh, sense of safety and security. And you can increase that um, processing through swinging, at, having your child swing and bounce and jump and push and pull and doing all these different things, changing their head position. I love um, having kids help clean using big movements like wiping off a table, washing an outdoor wall, carrying books. All of this gives us great information about where our body parts are. Climbing stairs and ladders and playground equipment. Um, doing chair push-ups, wall push-ups, wheelbarrow walking in a plank position so their backs aren't curved. They're just, their backs are kind of flat. These are all great ways to increase your child's proprioceptive body awareness and movement processing. There are also, there's so many fun ways to do this with the super duper move your body fun deck. Um, I love the Go Noodle activities uh, at gonoodle.com. Even things like playing hokey pokey and ring around the rosy, head, shoulders, knees, and toes slowly 
very, very slowly at first can really help a child to learn where their body parts are and to feel more pulled together and more present and able to engage. What you don't want is to have your child just at the mercy of their senses. You want, you know, and all of the things that happen out there in the world, you want to give them a rich sensory world that they are comfortable with. And finally, don't forget the breath, right? We all self-regulate through breathing. And if you tell your child, oh, calm down, you need to calm down, I can see you're getting upset, just take three deep breaths, <sighs> they won't know how to do it. They don't know how to do it. So you want to provide whistles and blow toys and teach them to blow feathers off their hand or cotton balls across a table. Um, you want to teach them to breathe out and make a lion roar or um, any or a dinosaur if they love dinosaurs. Anytime you get a child to breathe out, you're automatically going to get the breath in. And that helps to calm the entire nervous system. There's also a, a breathing technique called take five breathing. And you can learn about that on YouTube. Uh, just you know, enter, take five breathing. Finally, one of my favorite activities to do with kids, it always shifts their moods and helps them to really relax and have fun and feel better is to make a bubble mountain. Now I'm gonna show you a video in a second, but I want you to think about this. The first thing they need to be able to do is blow through a straw, right? Not drink from a straw, blow through the straw. So before you do this, you're gonna make sure they know how to blow through a straw. In the video I show you, there's some, I use some silicone um, aquarium tubing. Uh, and so we're using that, but you can use a straw, you can use anything like that. Let's see if I can get this going for you. Nice blowing. It's gonna, it's gonna fall over. So much fun. Kids love that. They absolutely love that. So try that with your child. And you're gonna find a lot more tips and techniques on my websites. Um, lots of webcasts and articles and tips and all that for you. And also on my Facebook pages. So, um, I'm so happy that we had this time together and I wanna to wish you and your families the very best. Bye.